I welcome you into this worship service. This is a place where everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and all things are possible. And I pray that you will be blessed and God will be glorified by what we do here today. And we would love to know who's worshiping with us. If you'd fill out that little attendance form, a little black pad at the end of the pew, and my clicker isn't working. <laughs> so, okay. That's the attendance form, which most of you know what that is. So fill that out, send it down to the person next to you. <laughs> and Children's Chapel, I think everybody knows about it, following children's worship in here. Tomorrow's a very special day. Uh, it is a day to honor and remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice. And for a lot of us in here, it's a very personal day because we know individuals who did exactly that. So I hope that you will honor and remember them. We have a lot of birthdays and anniversaries this week, so hang on as we go through this. <laughs> Jackie Early is not able to worship with us because, well, you know why. Uh, but wish her a happy birthday because of Sam. <laughs> Weight Watchers Tuesday at noon. Sid, Thurmer, Pat Thompson celebrating their anniversary on Tuesday. They are here. <laughs> Intercessory prayer Wednesday at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Mitzi and Greg Griffin celebrating their anniversary. <laughs> Wednesday, Randy Steele is celebrating his birthday on Wednesday, and <laughs> Scotty and Maria are celebrating their anniversary, so happy anniversary, <laughs> Thursday. Tom Smith celebrating... Is Tom here? I, well, I looked over there. So did you, because he always said you all always sit in the same place. So, and I'm going. You turned around. I went. I'm going blind. I didn't see him. Mike and Sandy Bradshaw celebrating their anniversary on Friday. Larry and Ann Gentry celebrating their anniversary Saturday. This is a popular month. Okay, I think we're done. I think we've, we've gotten all of it out of the way, but happy birthday anniversary to all of you. Uh, I think the word class is ending their study. You finish today, so you'll start a new study on something. Ooh, Ecclesiastes. And ooh, yay, Ecclesiastes. Boo, Job. But no, no, it'll, that'll be really, Fun and depressing. Uh, <laughs> then the, and I think the journey study group, you have to be getting close. Is it getting close to the end of that study? Oh, well, you got, you got lots of time. Oh, okay, next week. Ice cream social next Sunday, 6.30. There's a sign-up sheet for stuff you can bring on the bulletin board in the hallway. And if you want to know anything about junior camp, ask Amelia. Anything about youth camp, you can talk to Duncan. Now, on Memorial Day weekend, we always, we have a special uh, offering for uh, military chaplains. It's now called the Presbyterian Federal Chaplaincies, and I have asked a retired Army Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Carlton Harper, if he would, to tell us. On the 29th of July, 1775, during the Second Continental Congress, they passed a resolution establishing the Army Chaplaincy. Thus, it is the oldest federal chaplaincy. Next year, we will celebrate 250 years of chaplaincy. During that 250 years, 491 chaplains have been killed in combat. During that time, the chaplains moved with the army wherever they were. 
in the early days, chaplains were usually the ministers of congregations that went into the army. There was no standard. Today, there is that standard. I've talked about that before, so I won't bore you with that. Uh, but to tell you that as, as they continued to, to serve the army, uh, they went wherever the army was. And so as the chaplaincy was in the army during that great conflict that almost destroyed our nation, the Civil War, there were chaplains on both the Union Army and Confederate armies. And then during the settlement of the land that we call the United States, the contiguous 48 uh, states, chaplains uh, moved across the country with the army. And most often during those early days, uh, the chaplain was one of the more educated persons on the army post. And so they were tasked to teach in the post schools. During World War I, they were tasked with taking the mail to the front lines because they were going there anyway. Today, chaplains are only, by congressional law and Geneva Conventions, ministers, priests, rabbis, and imams only doing ministry. They are non-combatants. It gives you great prayer life when you go into battle and your only weapon is a Bible. <laughs> Let me tell you, the army chaplaincy, the federal chaplaincies across all the, the military and prisons and uh, veterans administration appreciate your support. They come to us, chaplains, and they support us. And your offering today will go to that ministry. I hope that you, if you didn't bring your checkbook, that you'll remember that and bring a, an offering next week. But I hope you'll give an offering also today to aid that very important ministry. I know from experience how much it means. Thank you. Carlton, I want you to stay. I have a special presentation I would like to make to you. Now, for those of you who may not know, last Saturday was the, was it when? Yes, like I said, it was Sunday <laughs> when we were actually going to make this presentation, but I wanted to do it on Memorial Day when remembering chaplains and because Memorial Day and because you were a chaplain in honor of his, the 55th anniversary of his ordination as a Cumberland Presbyterian minister. And in appreciation for that, we have a legacy of ministry certificate award that we want to present to you. There are a couple of mistakes on here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually read this until Wednesday. So another one is coming. So go, oh my, isn't that, you can't frame that one. Okay. But <laughs> you'll get one you can frame and a cross, our denomination cross. And we do appreciate your service. Yeah. Now, he said the chaplaincy is 250 years old. Carlton didn't serve that whole time. <laughs> it, it was only 55 years of knowing. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Did I miss anything? Then let us worship God.
We gather this morning to worship God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God spoke the word that brought the world into being through Jesus Christ. God broke the power of sin and death. By the Holy Spirit, God brought order out of chaos. We join with all the faithful to sing God's praise. Let us pray. God of all creation, we remember how you demonstrated your love for all your children in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And then, and then you gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth. May our worship unite us in a way that, that will reflect the grace of Jesus Christ, your love for all people, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. The children are invited to come forward for their special time. Good morning. Everybody doing okay? Good. Today is Trinity Sunday, and we're going to talk about a mystery. Now, do you know who that is? Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't do what? I know what happened to Humpty Dumpty. It's a mystery. There was a book written about it called Who Pushed Humpty Dumpty? And it's about this hard-boiled detective Joe Dumpty, Humpty's brother. And he is questioning, did he really slip? Was it an accident or 
did somebody push his brother off that wall? And if so, who could it be? Was it Little Miss Muffet? Was it Goldilocks? Was it one of the three bears? I know, maybe the big bad wolf, because it sounds like something a big bad wolf would do, right? It's still a mystery to me because I didn't read the book. I've just heard about the book, which a lot of people treat the Bible that way. They don't actually read the book. They just kind of hear about it, and it's a mystery. But the mystery this morning on Trinity Sunday is how do we understand God in three persons? How do we understand the Trinity? Because people who make fun of the we believe holy, holy, holy God in three persons, blessed Trinity, one God in three persons. And people who make fun of that and don't believe it go, now wait a minute, basic math, one plus one plus one equals three. And we go, yeah, but one plus one plus one equals three in one. And they go, no, how, how can that be? And so we scramble around and try to tell them how that can be. Now, in the scripture, you see this in a lot of different places, and you know about it. Remember last Sunday when I baptized, no, it was Mother's Day, when I baptized Vince, and I baptized him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One God, but in three persons. So how can we understand that? So we have different images Okay, what's that? This is not a tough question. This is, <laughs> this is kind of, that is an egg. Now, how many eggs do you have there? One egg. But there are three parts to that one egg. You have shell, the yolk. I have no idea what the white stuff's called. I call it white stuff. So you've got... Three in one. Also, water. Water can be solid or it can be liquid. Didn't you walk on water at, at the Sunday fun day? Well, you missed your chance to walk on water. Okay, it can be liquid or it can be steam, but it's of the same substance. It's still water. And that's how we explain it. First, and another way to think about first God was above us, then he was with us, now he's within us. God is creator, Jesus is our savior, and the Holy Spirit is our comforter, counselor, as the one who leads us into all truth. And that's an explanation of the mystery that is the Trinity. Okay, let's pray. You want to stand? You want to hold hands? Let's hold hands. Oh, Becky, what would you do? No. <laughs> I've got my wrist in a cast, but I didn't do anything. Not my fault. Yeah, well, let, yeah, do elbows. Let's pray. Uh, our, Father, our Father, we thank you, we thank you. For, creating all things, for creating all things, for coming to us, coming to us. for forgiving our sin. And for being with us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So I won't tell everybody. <laughs> We're going to do something a little different, which is always a little scary. We're going to sing this song as a round. The choir is going to be the second part, and we're going to be the first part. So if you sing with me, we'll be okay. Let's say it, stand and sing, Father, I adore you.
be seated. The offertory invitation is taken from the third chapter of Malachi, where God says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, How are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Let us worship now with the giving of our gifts to God. merciful and gracious God you have given us such a, a joyful privilege of moving from fearful withholding to giving with faith and trust believing that you will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it thank you for overcoming our doubts and our selfishness so we can know the joy of sharing may our gifts bless the lives of others as you have blessed our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It's Trinity Sunday, and so our scripture reading just selected passages of scripture that deal with the triune God. So I invite you to listen. Listen for the word of God to you. In Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there you have the first person of the Trinity. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That's the third person of the Trinity. Where was the second person of the Trinity? Not mentioned. Well, John does. <laughs> In the beginning 
was the Word, capital W, second person of the Trinity. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. and was there when everything was created. And then this, as it was also shown on the screen during the children's sermon, the Great Commission, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this will be our benediction, uh, which is not now. <laughs> it's so nobody gets up and leaves. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us once again go to God in prayer. And as we do, I'll remind you of the prayer concerns printed on the back of the bulletin. Uh, the only one that I will mention, and we want you to pray for everyone listed, is Kay is going to see her oncologist on the 29th. So we ask that you lift her up, and she's excited about it. So that's a very good thing. So remember her as she goes and as she has that consultation. If there's anyone that you would like to let us know about, you're invited to say their name out loud as we first go to God silently in prayer, and then I will lead in the pastoral prayer. Let us go to God. O oh God, our Father, we come before you with deep respect, marveling at your power and might. You are so great, and we are so small. And yet you have crowned us with glory and honor. You let us rule everything your hands have made, and you put it all under our power. O oh Lord, your name is wonderful in all the earth. Loving Savior, you are lifted up in worship as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. When we gather, our attention is drawn away from ourselves and placed where it should belong, upon you. It is here that we find the grace that covers our sins and our invitation to be born again and enter your eternal kingdom. Holy Spirit, we know that we can't do anything without your presence and your power. You have inspired the Bible to be written, but we haven't always read the word faithfully. You have given us special gifts to use, but we have sometimes neglected them. You are ready to give us peace and joy, but we have sometimes lived in anxiety and gloom. Forgive us and warm our hearts, enlighten our minds, cleanse our thoughts, comfort our souls, and enliven our wills through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How do you explain a doctrine that nobody completely understands? How can you explain a divine mystery? Now, my problem this week went beyond that. My problem was, how can I write a sermon on a doctrine I don't completely understand? So, I did what I usually do. I went to the Bible. 
and I will give you the scriptural evidence, then I will give you my interpretation and application of the biblical references. And I will encourage you to do exactly the same thing this week. You go to your Bible, you research it, you can use the passages I have in the outline, and you interpret them for yourselves and then apply them to your life and your situation where you are. Now, we're not the only ones confused with this concept, with this doctrine. It gave the early Christian church a lot of trouble. They had a hard time grasping the three in one concept. And as you know, the early Christian church, there were Jewish converts who believed very strongly that there is one God, monotheism. But then you had converts who had Greek and Roman backgrounds, and they believed, well, they worshipped many gods. So for the Jewish converts, it went too far, but for Greeks and Romans, it didn't go far enough. And so we struggled to kind of put together a statement that would explain what we believe, how we believe it, why we believe it, but it took us half a century to do that, or it took them half a century to do it. Now we came up, Council of Nicaea 325, with the Nicene Creed. It talks about it. We have the Apostles' Creed, which we state on Sundays occasionally that has a triune formula, but it wasn't until 500 AD and the Athanasian Creed that is considered to be the definitive statement on the Trinity. So I'm going to read you part of it. Don't panic. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It says, now this is the Christian faith, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity without either confusing the persons or dividing the substance. For the Father's person is one, the Son's another, the Holy Spirit another. But the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one. Their glory is equal, their majesty co-equal. And then it goes on to say that the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty, yet there are not three almighties, there is one almighty. That's my favorite part. One almighty. <laughs> it just, okay, I've, I've got a weird sense of humor. Then it goes on to say, yet there are not three gods, but one God. Okay, now the question. Are you still with me or did you fall asleep? Somewhere during the Athanasian Creed. Is this doctrine necessary? I mean, do we really need this doctrine? And I'm going to say, yes, we do. Because it is there as creeds and doctrines, they are there to help us understand God. God's relationship with us, our relationship with God, how God communicates with us, how we communicate with God. It's how we get to know God. Now the question is, do you have to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity to be a Christian? There are some theologians that say, yes, you do. I am not one of those theologians. So ask Carlton and Vernon, they will tell you. <laughs> they will give you the definitive answer. Okay, the next one is, do you, well, okay, do you have to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity to be a Christian? See, technically, literally, we don't believe in a doctrine. We don't believe in a creed. That'd be, ideal, that'd be idolatrous. It would make it an idol. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We don't believe in a doctrine. Okay, do you have to believe the doctrine of the Trinity to be saved? All of you who have ever been in this worship service with me before on a communion Sunday know the answer to that question. No. <laughs> We're not saved by correct theology. Uh, we are saved by having a personal dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the creeds of doctrine was formulated because there was heresy in the early church. There were those who said that Jesus was not divine. He was just a person. Great person, the greatest person who ever lived, but he wasn't divine. Another heresy was that he didn't become the Christ until his baptism by John in the Jordan. And we went, no, on both of those, he is divine, part of the Trinity. And I quoted the scripture, and I'll go through this again with you a little bit later. And that's why the creeds and this doctrine was formulated. Now, two quotes. I shared these with you last year. 
Erickson quote, can you read this one with me? Try to explain the doctrine of the Trinity and you'll lose your mind. But try to deny it and you'll lose your soul. I believe the first part. I do not believe the second part. But every time I try to write a sermon on the Trinity, I lose my mind. <laughs> this one I love. For all of you who have a Methodist background from John Wesley, bring me a worm that can comprehend a man, and then I will show you a man that can comprehend the triune God. And to that I say, amen, because I, the finite has a hard time with the infinite. Okay, my finite mind has a hard time with the infinite. So how many gods do we have? I mean, in the Bible, you have both. And I'm going to give you a lot of passages of scripture. So hang in there with me. And I'll get you to read part of it with me. The part that's in yellow, you get, I will invite you to read with me. So how many gods do we have? This is where the plurality of God in the Old Testament, there are, there's more than one God. It seems like there are a bunch of gods up there. So in Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his image, male and female, he created in his image, but there's more than one. Our is what it says. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us. So there's more than one up there. Come, let us, the Tower of Babel, Babel, however you want to pronounce it, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And now from Isaiah. This really gets confusing, singular, plural. I don't think English are supposed to do that, are you? I, I don't know. Yeah, but this is Hebrew. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? So, is it just in the Old Testament? Does the New Testament say anything about it? So let me share several passages from the New Testament with you. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So you have the Father saying, this is my beloved Son. You have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Then you have the Son, God incarnate in Jesus, receiving the baptism. And this, we all know this from the Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And this from 2 Corinthians. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So there is more than one God, but there are just three. <laughs> just, he says. Okay, so you've got the plurality. Now, is there a oneness in here at all? Where do we get that concept? So I'll share several things with you. And the first from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. So you have one God justifying both Jewish converts and Gentile converts. Those who have Greek and Roman backgrounds, everybody but one God. Read this with me from James. You believe that there is one God? Good. So how confusing is that going to be to the early Christian church? I don't know. It's confusing to me. So this is the description you have. The Trinity, someone said, a good way to put it is triunity, the three in one. Three distinct persons and yet of the same substance, of the same essence. One God in three persons. So helpful images I've already shared with you. And all of these are imperfect, by the way, and some of them verge on heresy. <laughs> 
But we have finite minds. We need, I need, I'm visual. I think you figured that one out. I, I like being able to picture things to understand it. So all of the images are helpful, not perfect. Uh, a tree I didn't mention, and you know what, a tree has three parts, right? You got roots, you got trunk, you got branches with leaves. I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a pastor, but there's just one Larry. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. So, now the application. What does God want? Okay, I preached on this, I've forgotten when, but from Micah, what does he want? For us to live justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. And I still believe that is what God wants. But in the Trinity, what jumps out at me, there are three in one. He wants unity and community with all of us sharing together. And one theologian said that the Trinity, each person of the Trinity is in a divine dance, perfectly coordinated, moving with each other, with the same purpose, with the same direction. Now, the way that I see it, the image I'm going to share with you is, I think of it as a trio singing in perfect harmony, beautifully blending together. And I think of us, every one of us in the Christian church, every one of us in the world as an orchestra supporting the song of the trio in the opera they are creating. Now, if you have that image, do you know what it's like to listen to a choir if somebody is blending perfectly, sticking out above all the others and it's not supposed to be a solo? No, I'm not looking at Chris for any reason. It, do, do you know what that's like? Or off key, not on pitch. Do you, does it kind of make you... If you have any musical training at all, that'll drive you nuts. You'll just, or can you imagine an orchestra playing, but not everybody blending together, not everybody playing the right notes? Can you imagine what that would be like? Or maybe not even playing the same song. I'm going to use an illustration that'll get me in trouble. Okay? We have an organist and a pianist. <laughs> and the pianist is on vacation. They work beautifully together. They come in together. They work on this together. And they're always together, except one Sunday, not too long ago. And I've forgotten what it was on. I don't know if it was a doxology. It was, it was a doxology. <laughs> one of them was playing the wrong song. They came in, and one was, because <laughs> I'm not going to say it's Barbara, but one was, one, one was playing the wrong song. I didn't know what to sing. I didn't know. I'm going, oh, my goodness, I don't know what to do. And later, I, was, I didn't know who did it. I didn't know who was wrong, and Barbara said it was me. She flipped two pages instead of one. Now, that is, it just shows Barbara is human. That, that, you know, she's not perfect, although I think she is perfect. But, yeah, and so does the choir. <laughs> well, that's what the world is like. We're not together. We're not in harmony. Uh, there are some that are not even playing the same song as God. And it got so bad and so terrible that God himself came down and gave us the sheet music. And what did we do with it? We tore it up and nailed it to a cross. We are messed up people. Guess what? We're still doing it today. He has given us, here it is, <laughs> the sheet music. We've got it. And we don't pay any attention to it. And God wants us to sing together in harmony. We are to support, we are the supporting characters. We are the orchestra, each playing our own part, playing, hopefully, the same song, supporting the Trinity. He, we are to be God's melting pot. Galatians 3, 28. 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And that is God's desire for us. He wants this. You see, there is, and we all know, there is a God-shaped void in all of our lives that no other person can fill. But there is also a human-shaped void in our lives that not even God can fill. We were meant, and I mentioned, I, I mentioned this several times, I've mentioned it before, we need one another. We were created to be together, to share together. And he wants the Christian church to be a place where Democrats and Republicans can worship together, where liberals and conservatives can worship together. And in case you don't know, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church is fairly conservative. We are more conservative than PCUSA. We're not as conservative as PCA or ARP. But we have Democrats and Republicans in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We have liberals and conservatives in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And guess what? We all believe that the Bible is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. The only thing we will disagree on is interpretation and application. And we will. And we believe in individual interpretation of the scripture. Or so we say that we do. Now I think some of you know, and I'm really debating on whether to use part of this or not, uh, but uh, I have a son-in-law who is an ordained Baptist minister. Uh, he is not a pastor. He's never wanted to be a pastor. He's a missionary for a while. Uh, he is a teacher. He's always wanted to be a teacher. He has a PhD in theology. We don't agree on several things. We don't agree on women in ministry. Uh, we don't agree on mode of baptism. And I'm not going to tell you the other things we don't agree on. I respect his opinion. He respects my opinion. I don't try to convince him he's wrong. I don't, he doesn't try to convince me I'm wrong. We, he, he likes to talk about it. He likes to debate it. And you'll play biblical ping pong. I'll serve up my passage defending my position. He'll serve up his defending his position. But in the end, we can worship together. We can love each other. We can eat together. We don't get mad at each other because we're not the same. And we don't belong to the same political party either. And we can talk about that without getting upset, without getting mad. We don't try to dehumanize those who disagree with us. We don't try to demonize them. And yet there are those who are doing that. And this is part of it I kind of worried about doing. But I will look at Chris. When I was in boot camp, one of the things they did, they dehumanized and demonized the people you're going to fight. And I could never be a non-combatant. I told Carlton that. If I'd gone into the chaplaincy, I would have gone, uh-uh, you put me in a war zone? I want to be able to defend myself and the people around me. I, I, but anyway, but bless you. <laughs> bless you for doing that because you are a better man than I am. Uh, now I've forgotten where I was going with that. But in, to de in boot camp, and I don't know if you did it with you or not, but they dehumanize the people you're going to fight. I mean, and demonize them. And they do it in several different ways. One, they call them names. And I'm not going to share those names with you. But it's supposed to make it easier when you have to do what you have to do when you're in the war zone. Okay, I wasn't crazy about it then. I hate it now. When you're talking about non-combatants, fellow Americans, even fellow Christians who are demonizing one another, who are dehumanizing one another. This is not God's desire for us. He wants the Christian church to be a place we can all worship together, we can all share together, even though we have differences in interpretation and application. We believe in the same God, the same Jesus, the same Holy Spirit, the same Bible. It's just differences in interpretation and application. Can we honor God enough to honor one another? And that is a question that's before us right now. And it is a place where different races come together. 
And God sees past the color of our skin, where we're from, our ethnicity, our nationality. And what does he look at? What does he care about? That's right, your heart. He looks at your motivation. And I, see, I shouldn't do this. And if you're demonizing and dehumanizing people, your heart's in the wrong place. Uh, you are not in harmony with the Trinity. You're not even singing the same song. That's my interpretation. You're welcome to yours. <laughs> a place where we're of one mind and one heart. There's a place where faults are forgiven and relationships restored. A place where broken hearts are mended and souls are saved. I'm going to close this sermon by reading a quote from John Ortberg. And it's a long quote, but it's the end of the sermon. So you can go, yay, when he finishes, we're done. said, the doctrine of the Trinity is honored when the oneness that characterizes it, the unity of the Spirit, is prized and guarded and revered by the one true church. Whenever human beings tolerate unresolved conflict in friendships or families or churches, whenever gossip and slander go unchallenged, whenever ministry leaders attack other Christians in spirit of arrogance, or if they want to believe and spread bad things about those who disagree with others, whenever the unity of the Spirit is treated cavalierly, the Trinity is dishonored all day in a million different ways in our homes, our neighborhoods, our churches, our families, our friendships, and our cities. You and I are either moving the world a little closer to God's picture of shalom, peace, or moving it a little farther away. There is a line from the musical Les Miserables that gets very close to what John wrote. To love another person is to see the face of God. You now are invited to take your place in the eternal circle of self-giving love. Every person you see, every moment of your life is an opportunity to live in and extend the fellowship of the Trinity. We have scores of opportunities each day. This is what each human moment can be about. Every time you forgive someone who hurts you, encourage someone who feels defeated, extend compassion to someone who stands alone, confront someone in love, open your heart to a friend, reconcile with an enemy, devote time to a child, you align yourself with God's central purpose in this world. Anne Lamont wrote, the Gulf Stream will pass through a straw, provided that the straw is aligned with the Gulf Stream and not at cross purpose with the Gulf Stream. To live in and contribute to God's dream of community is the reason you were born. It is what you were created for. Neglect this. And it doesn't matter what else you do, how many pyramids you build, how impressive your resume. You are at cross purposes with the Gulf Stream. Neglect this and you will die a failure. Devote yourself to this one task, to loving people as they are. And no matter what else you may not achieve, you will lead a magnificent life. Let us pray. Loving God, we want to live a magnificent life. We want to be a reflection of your love, your grace, your forgiveness. We want to bring shalom into our relationships, into our family, into our churches, into this denomination, into the world. We want to be aligned with your will. Align us. This is our prayer, lifted through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I will invite you now to affirm your faith by reading the affirmation of faith that is printed. So would you stand as we affirm our faith together? Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God, 
unjustly condemned for blasphemy. Jesus was crucified, giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, delivering us from death to eternal life. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, every race and people, to live in community. We trust in God the Holy Spirit, the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and binds us together with all believers in one body of Christ, the church. My invitation to you is this week to do what I suggested before. Go through the Bible. How do you understand what it's saying about our God? How do you understand him? Then, how are you going to apply it? How are you going to make it live in your life? How are you going to be in harmony with your understanding of what God wants? I also extend the invitation for anyone here who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ and if you felt the movement of God's Spirit, and if you would like to publicly profess your faith, and you may do it privately, and I'd love to talk to you. But if you would like to do that publicly, you're invited to do that as we sing the first, second, third verses of hymn number 71. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.